session on Bhagavad Gita, your source of inspiration by Jayaji. I request Jayaji to give us an overview of chapter 14. We will begin with the invocation. Chapter 14, which speaks of the three gunas. The Bhagavad Gita helps achieve excellence in the world and takes us beyond to the state of enlightenment, realization. The Gita makes a thorough analysis of the human personality because it is with this personality that we can reach God. It identifies the areas of weakness and removes them and enables us to use our strengths to achieve that high state of enlightenment. Now, every human being is made of matter and spirit. Matter is the body, mind, intellect, spirit, Atman. The Bhagavad Gita helps us sieve out matter and what remains is spirit. Matter is of three different hues called gunas or qualities. They are sattva, purity, rajas, passion and tamas, ignorance. This is India's and Vedanta's greatest contribution to the understanding of the human mind, not done anywhere else in the world. The gunas determine the quality of thoughts you entertain, the nature of emotions you have in your mind, and the type of actions that you perform. Every little detail, every characteristic emerges from the three gunas. The gunas determine whether the mix of gunas. So all human beings have all three gunas. It is the proportion that matters, that makes the difference. But together, sattva, rajas and tamas bind us to the world. Like the three primary colors, red, yellow and blue, that mix to create all the colors in the world, the combinations of the gunas create the infinite variety of beings in the world. Let's take a look at these three gunas. Tamas, the lowest, is a state of inertia, indifference, indolence, laziness, care hang attitude. In this state, your best qualities get shrouded and inherent talent is prevented from manifesting. Rajas is a state of stress, agitation, ill at ease, brought about by desire and its modification, greed, greed, craving and lust. The incessant desire driven activity and the resultant turbulence in the mind make for mediocrity. Sattva, 
the highest human quality that which makes a human being what the human being is is tranquility of mind when one functions at one's best this is the state that all executives sports persons and professionals in every field of activity strive for being in the zone as they call it performing at peak levels however nobody knows how to achieve it much less remain in this superlative state of being the bhagavad gita spells it out clearly and simply so that everyone can operate out of one's best which is sattva while marginalizing and eventually eradicating the rajas and tamas within this chapter deals with the three gunas it details the traits of sattva rajas and tamas and how they bind the human being guna literally means rope in sanskrit everyone has all three gunas as we saw but as long as you remain oblivious of their nature and the influence they have on you you get bound to them bound by them when you understand the role that they play in your life you can change the guna mix with it verse 6 of chapter 14 speaks of how sattva binds you तत्र सत्वामेर्मलत्वाकाशकमनामयं सुखसंगेनबद्नातीज्ञानसंगेनचानघ and curative it binds by attachment to happiness and attachment to knowledge o anagha pure because sattva is free from desire and ego relatively hence the light clarity the vision and the transparency by which the brilliance of atman shines forth you have the right assessment right values right judgment your bright sharp quick to respond curative you're healthy at all levels physically you're fit your emotions are pure and positive intellect mature smart and objective as shakespeare said we a personality like this with sattva within you you find towns in trees books in running brooks sermons in stones and good in everything so you are able to x-ray through the material components and see the divinity behind it all but sattva also binds us it binds by attachment to happiness and to knowledge you need to drop even this subtle refined attachment to get to atman rajas on the other hand is marked by passion breeding thirst and attachment it binds by attachment to action because you are dependent on the fruit of action you are invested in that action and you want to return from that action and tamas is born of ignorance it binds firmly to carelessness sloth and sleep so this laziness this tamas is within each one of us and it functions in us so you have to see where it functions and fight it like every morning even if you are doing exercise every day just before you wake up i mean just after you wake up sorry there is something in you which says chalo yaar go back to sleep skip exercise for today there is something else that says no get up and go 
So the, this is tamas playing in us and sattva. So what you listen to, what you act out of is what is going to make the difference between success and failure in your life. You can excel only when you operate out of your sattva. So you come up with peak performance only when sattva predominates. When rajas prevails, there is greed, disquiet, mental agitation, restlessness and hankering that weighs you down. And we all experience that. And when tamas reigns supreme, you are overcome with delusion, confusion, heedlessness and inertia. What happens when sattva predominates? Verse 11 talks about it. Sarva dvare shudehesmin prakasha upajayate jnanam yadatada vidya vivrudham sattva mityuta when the light of wisdom radiates through all doors of this body, then it should be known that sattva is predominant. Sattva, by its very nature, is transparent. So even though it is an impurity, you can see through sattva and see the divinity behind it. That is why a sattvic person is so attractive. The magnetic pull that a sattvic person has is inescapable. Rajas is translucent. The activity, the success, the, the, the achievements of a rajasic person attract you. But the desire and ego put you off. And tamas is opaque. It is so disgusting. You know, tamas is characterized by extreme laziness, inertia, where a person is not willing to work even for a selfish end. And he becomes a nuisance to society. Addictive habits like drinking, smoking, gambling, which impact on the family members. And he doesn't care. He doesn't care even about himself. How can he care about his family members? Now, sattva offers no resistance. So, divinity shines forth in a sattvic person. So, how does it operate? His perception is clear. He sees things before anybody else can see them. He has insight. In the Bhagavad Gita verses, we've seen the phrase, yaha pashyati saha pashyati. One who sees, sees. So a sattvic person sees, sees things that escape the rest of us. Like in Sherlock Holmes, he was so smart, he would pick the criminal straight away. And Dr. Watson didn't have a clue. So he asks him, how did you find out? And Sherlock Holmes says, elementary, my dear Watson. So what is elementary? What is so simple and effortless for a sattvic person? A rajasic person doesn't see at all or makes mistakes. A tamasic person is in ignorance. Actions are perfect, refined, chaste, attractive. It reaches the state of effortless ex excellence. So whether it is a cricketer or a musician or an artist or a surgeon, the actions stand out. So when a musician sings, it is not the notes that convey the feeling. It is not the notes that inspire the audience, that move them to tears. It is the spirit behind the notes. And that spirit comes through sattva. And this is true in any action. So the world stands up and gives a uh, standing ovation to that person. Not because of the work, but because of the sattvic content. In the Mahabharata, after the Mahabharata war, they had a celebration to 
celebrate uh, victory. And each person was given a job to do. Those days they didn't have event managers like we do. So they asked Krishna, instead of allotting a job to him, they asked him, what would you like to do? Krishna very humbly said, I'll take care of the shoe stand. You know, in the Indian tradition, you don't walk in with the shoes. You leave the shoes out and go in. And when there are lots of people, you need to manage the shoes. Otherwise, there'll be chaos. So the organizers agreed. They didn't realize the mistake they were making. What happened was this simple job of managing the shoe stand, Krishna did so well and so cheerfully that the audience that came for the celebration refused to go in. They were so completely enchanted and captivated by the work that Krishna was doing. He wasn't sitting there giving a lecture on Bhagavad Gita. He was just handling the shoes. This is it. Each one of us must strive to make our actions sattvic, pure, perfect in such a way that you gain the satisfaction that that which had to be done has been done. Never mind what the world thinks of it, but incidentally, the world will be impressed, captivated, and admiring of your actions. Then comes the mind. The mind is pure, without selfishness. And the love that a sattvic person has is without any expectations, without any demands. He just loves you for what you are. And that gives such a, a relief because, you know, in all our relationships, there is always pressure put on you because the other person is expecting things of you, is making demands on you. And it becomes a negative relationship. Even though you may want to return the person's love uh, as you want to love the person, but it puts you off the selfishness. So he has pure love, not attachment. But the love that he has is well controlled. The mind itself is well under the control of the intellect. It doesn't allow the mind to run riot. The emotions of a sattvic person turn to a strength, not remain a weakness. Then comes the intellect. The intellect is objective, sharp, brilliant, alert, and thinking is clear. Therefore, the sattvic person is successful in anything that he does. You know, the one quality that ensures success in any endeavor is clarity of thinking. This is why when before the Mahabharata war, when Arjuna chose Krishna alone and let go of his armies, his ammunition and all his material strengths, by that choice alone, Arjuna had already won the war before it started because he had a clear thinker on his side. And as it panned out, it is Krishna and his advice that played the stellar role in ensuring that the Pandavas won victory. The relative strengths of the three gunas also determine the environment one goes to after death. This is explained in verse 14. What happens when a sattvic person dies? Yada sattve pravruddhe tu pralayam yati deha brud tadottam avidam lokan if sattva is predominant when the embodied meets with death, one attains the stainless worlds of the knowers of the Supreme. A sattvic person is born in a spiritual family where his sattvic content blossoms in the environment of purity and tranquility. 
so when you meet with an environment that is conducive to your inner personality there is growth because there is no resistance you don't have to overcome external challenges and then start working on yourself if a sattvic inward looking person is born in a rajasic environment where everyone is partying everyone is shopping everyone is you know this kind of thing like today there was an article in um, the media somewhere which speaks of how the chinese youth are resisting the pressure the stress that they are put to in china so there's a chinese gentleman who has posted on social media apparently their own social media that he has opted out of the rat race and works only two months in a year his life is minimalistic and he's a sattvic person but to overcome the the environment and assert yourself requires effort but here what happens is that a sattvic person is naturally born see this is the law the theory of reincarnation states that you are born with a handful of desires vasanas that are pressing for fulfillment these are called prarabdha vasanas so these prarabdha vasanas determine your environment your gender your personality your body your family everything and this environment is best suited tailor made for the fulfillment of your prarabdha vasanas during your lifetime you have access to the sanchita sanchita means total total number of vasanas that you have you can add to them subtract from them purify them go downhill you can do what you like with them but one thing is assured to you that your prarabdha vasanas will get fulfilled now what he's saying is if you make your entire personality sattvic then your prarabdha vasanas also will be extraordinarily sattvic in fact the sanchita may not be there you already brought down your vasanas to a bare minimum so what kind of environment will you find a highly spiritual environment where the sattvic content is given an opportunity to blossom and grow fully it's like providing the right soil the right moisture the right uh, ingredients for a seed to flourish even after that such a person may have to go through many many births before he completely eliminates the rajas and tamas and establishes himself in sattva and then pure sattva catapults you to the state of realization now what we need to remember is that at death at the point of death we cannot carry forward our wealth we can't take our family members along with us there is no a uh, means by which you can transfer your wealth like in a bank transaction online you can transfer there is no online transfer to the next janma of your assets your family members won't come with you try asking them tonight go and say will you, you know when i die will you come with me i love you so much you won't get an answer and even if they want to come with you they can't knowledge you may be a nobel prize winner and einstein but you can't carry that you're born with all the knowledge wiped clean the only thing we carry forward with us is our gunas the quality of our thoughts our vasanas our desires yet we prefer to chase after the world rather than spend at least a little bit of our time in developing sattva that will take us to a better environment you know there is no guarantee that we will live another 10 15 years we have no idea when death will come to us it could be 5 minutes from now yet till the very end 
We don't think of the beyond. Not only that, what is the use if you are in a fabulous mansion in this Janma? You die and you're born in a slum on the opposite side of the road. Does that make any sense? So that awareness must be there. So that you enjoy the world, but invest a little bit of your time and effort in buying insurance for your future. You buy all kinds of insurance, like you insure your health, you have medical insurance, you insure your car, you insure your home from fire, theft, so on and so on and so forth. How about insuring yourself in a state in ancient India? They had a strange custom. It was a very prosperous kingdom, but the custom they had was that they would appoint a king once in five years. That king would have, would remain king for five years. And at the end of the five years, this was the strange part. They would put him in a boat and ferry him across the river to the other shore where there was a wild jungle, wild animals there, and he would be devoured by the wild animals. So king after king came the first year, they enjoyed the power, wealth, and all the facilities that the kingdom offered. Second year, little bit, they were worried about what would happen after the five years. First year went very fast. By the time the third year came, occasionally they would get stressed out. Fourth year, it was a very real worry. And by the time the fifth year came, they were tormented. And the last day, they had to be picked up literally and thrown into the boat and ferried across. In this scenario, once a young, bright man volunteered to be king. And his behavior was very different from all the other kings. With every passing year, his cheer improved, he was more joyful, he was more, he was enjoying his kingdom more, everything, he was a happier man. And the subjects wondered, does he not know what's going to happen after five years? The fifth year, he was throwing parties every day. And on the last day of his kingship, he threw a magnificent banquet for all the citizens. And when the time came, he waved goodbye to them and stepped into the boat cheerfully. He sat there. When the boat was halfway across the river, he looked at the boatman and said, ah, I forgot one little thing. So the boatman said, what? And he almost laughed at him because he was about to die. It doesn't matter whether he forgets. The king said, I forgot the boatman. How much do you earn here to carry a king once in five years across the river? So he said 3,000 rupees a month. The king said, if I double your salary, will you work for me? The boatman was almost shocked. He said, he thought he was offering him a job in heaven. Just then they reached the, the other bank. And the boatman, to his surprise, found that instead of the jungle, here was a magnificent kingdom which the king had constructed every day of the five years that he was temporary king on the other side. So you know what he was doing? While he was having a good time, while he was doing performing his jobs and administration, this, that and the other, in that kingdom, he was systematically transferring his assets to the other shore where he would be permanent king. This is what you and I need to do. By all means, enjoy the world. You can party, you can shop till you drop, you can do what you like in the world. But don't forget to transfer your assets to the other kingdom, to the future, to your next life, which means focus on Enriching yourself from within. 
focus on changing the guna mix upgrading the guna mix so that your sattvic content increases rajas is kept going and tamas is eliminated and eventually even that rajas is refined into sattva and you become prid 100% sattvic you then can't remain as a human being so you roll over to the state of enlightenment or self realization now in not when you are on a mission to cultivate sattva you need to know one very important thing and that is these three gunas surface in your mind at different times of the day why it is so we don't know that but that that it is so is a given whatever sattvic content you have whether it is 5% or 80% surfaces in your mind early morning between 4 and 6 am you get it 4 am to 6 am that's it during this time your mind is fresh alert conducive for subtle refined thinking nowadays they have noticed that the most successful people in the world the billionaires in the us wake up between 5 and 5:30 am i visit the us every year except now during the covid times and i meet people from all over and i find that they are early risers i had noticed when i was in school 9th 10th 11th standard and when i was preparing for the exam i would wake up at quarter to 4 be at my desk at 4 study till 7 take a short nap till 7:30 am mind you get ready and go to school after that there was no need to study and i couldn't study early to bed and this was my routine i had noticed that one hour of study in the morning between 4 and 6 am is equivalent of two hours of study during the day and three hours of study post sundown at night nowadays you find people are waking up late and going to bed late they're partying till early morning that goes against the grain so if you are serious about developing sattva you have to wake up early morning now suddenly don't try and wake up at 4 o'clock you'll get jet lag sitting here in mumbai what you must do is start waking up half an hour before your normal wake, waking time so you get that clear half an hour to focus to invest your energies in the study of vedanta in the study of the bhagavad gita i very strongly recommend that you take the pen drives which we have to on offer where every verse of the 701 verses of the bhagavad gita are first recited individually english translation given and explanation like i'm explaining now but in greater detail because now here is only the overview you don't get uh, an in depth uh, picture of the bhagavad gita study it in the morning make notes write down the concepts ideas that have struck you as important it can't be more than four or five points during the study period and during the day reflect over these points experiment with them see what a difference it makes in your life see the difference between what you are living and what the gita is talking about and try and reduce the gap and if you do this for a year irrespective of how many verses you cover don't be in a hurry to cover the verses that is not important the important bit is the reflection and the application you will find over a period of one year there is a distinct improvement in your personality i am saying this with confidence because i did it in my life 
And I know several others who have done it. So this is it. If you want to bring about a transformation in your personality, an upgradation of your gunas, an increase in the sattvic content, this is what you need to do. So this is applicable. This is true, not only when it comes to death, not only after death, but also during one's lifetime. Entertain higher thoughts, cultivate sattva, and your environment magically changes. The mission of life is to go beyond the three gunas and get liberated from the traumatic cycle of birth, death, decay, and sorrow. You are born in the world only to attain immortality. That is why in the past, every Indian would pray, Asatoma Satkamaya, lead me from falsehood to truth, from ignorance, darkness to light, Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya, and Mrityorma Amritam Karmaya, from death to immortality. This is what has kept the Indian culture going. And in spite of the degradation, in spite of our best efforts to destroy ourselves, it still remains. And I'm very optimistic that this knowledge will assert itself because truth will prevail. Satyameva Jayati. However much the youngsters of today, the younger generation is resisting the Indian culture and unabashedly adopting the American way, still the Indian culture will prevail because it is the truth. But only sattva can take you there. So it's extremely important to look within, identify your sattvic qualities, increase it to the extent possible during your lifetime. And then you can do what you like. So it's like this. If you have, if your garden is divided into three, one is where you have cultivated the most exotic plants and flowers and fruits. The other one third portion is the lawn and one third of your garden is left unattended where weeds are growing. What would you say to a person who is putting manure in the weeds, watering the weeds, nurturing and nourishing the weeds and completely neglecting the exotic section? This is what you are doing. You are encouraging your tamasic qualities by late nights, partying. Why are you doing all this? Because you believe that Americans, Westerners are doing it, but this is not even true. You go to America and see no restaurant is open beyond 9 p.m. during the week. During the week, people go back home, have an early dinner, go to bed because they have their focus is on work. They wake up early the next morning. There are traffic jams at 6 a.m. in most large cities. In California and Los Angeles, where traffic is a problem, people go to work at 5.30 in the morning. There is no partying, there is no drinking, there is no indulgence during the week. They work and they work hard. It is only in India that there is non-stop partying, whether there is lockdown or not. In complete disregard of the dangers of the COVID crisis re-emerging. That is why the second wave started in Malbar Hill. That was most badly affected. Why should it be? These are the people who are the most educated, the cream of society, and they have no awareness. This is complete lack of responsibility, complete lack of awareness, and of course, zero sattva. So let's move to verse 20. Janma Mrutyu Jaradukhaihi 
The embodied one, having gone beyond these three gunas which create the body, is totally liberated from birth, death, decay and sorrow and enjoys immortality. Now the situation is, Atman plus gunas is the individual you and me. This individual is totally bound, shackled, imprisoned within the limits of the body because of your identification and unintelligent attachment to the body, mind and intellect. Body means body, mind and intellect. But you can transcend these gunas. How? With every thought, identify with the spirit, Atman, rather than the body. Then you become free from the five metamorphic changes that every individual necessarily has to go through. And that is birth, growth, disease, decay and death. At every stage there is misery. Birth is painful. Everyone is born crying. Growth at every stage there is effort, disappointment, pain, trauma. Whether it is physical growth uh, from an infant to a teenager or emotional and intellectual growth where you go through the pangs of teenage life. Then there is at every stage disease as we well know because we are all going through this COVID crisis. And then there is the decay that comes with old age. However much you resist it, your bones start creaking, your joints give pain, your eyesight gets blurred, your hearing goes down. Do you know that hearing is maximum up to the age of around 20? After that, the hearing starts going down. We don't realize it till you become old and then you need a hearing aid. Your digestion slows down. Kidneys start, stop functioning to peak level, so on and so forth. And ultimate illness and death. This every single person who is born must necessarily go through. The question is, if you, are you identified with it? Are you invested in the body? Are you attached to the body? Then you feel the pangs even more because not only do you suffer when it hits you at that time, you suffer in anticipation. Like right now, there are lots of people who say, oh, I'll get COVID, so I won't do this. That fear of contracting COVID is killing you anyway. Like Shakespeare said, cowards die many times before their death. The brave die but once. So you suffer in anticipation. You of course suffer when it hits you. And even then there is, apart from the physical suffering, there is the depression, the uh, low morale, all of that which nearly kills you. And post the, the experience, the sort of the painful experience, you relive the past and increase your suffering. That is why you post all these on social media, you send WhatsApp messages to friends about how terrible it was, you are seeing it. So all put together, it becomes unbearable. How can you, even while the body is going through it, how can you not suffer? See, that is the thing. Pain is a given. The moment you're born, you will be susceptible to pain. You can't help that. At least the body has, is susceptible. But you need not suffer. That suffering is a choice. Exert that choice. Choose not to suffer. This every single individual has. And if you exert that choice powerfully, while the body is going through all these changes, the spirit, you, are not suffering. 
How do you do that? Switch your identification. Just observe your thoughts. From the time you wake up till the time you go to sleep, most of the time you are thinking of body, body, body. The moment you wake up, you think of what's for breakfast. Breakfast is barely over, you're thinking of what's for lunch. And now, particularly in the COVID crisis, because you have nothing better to do, everyone's become a foodie. Take this opportunity to invest in your mental health, in the health of your mind and intellect, in getting back to the spirit. So keep telling yourself, while you're doing whatever it is that you're doing, I am not the body, I am Atman. I am not the body, I am Atman. I am not the body, I am Atman. Even though you are not yet Atman, you are still engaged with the body, still invested in the body. When you have a headache, if you think this, you will be able to bear with it without popping crocin. You get a stomach upset. Tell yourself, I am not the body, I am not my stomach, I am Atman. You will be able to recover faster from the illness. So, as you change your focus from body, mind, intellect to Atman, you get disentangled, declutched from your material components. And while the body is going through all of this, you remain samam and this is what is when happens when you are established in sattva. So the wise, see the individual, you, the unwise person, the foolish person is entangled with the gunas and therefore is subject to all these metamorphic changes, birth, growth, disease, decay, death and suffers. The wise identifies with the self mentally, physically, he's the same as anybody else. Then immediately he's no longer susceptible to the change. He becomes that changeless entity. Now we don't understand this because we have got acclimatized to sorrow. It's like if you go to a slum dweller and say, I have a formula by which you can get out of this filth and um, unclean environment and enjoy a good life. He will say, I'm happy here in the slum, why should I move? It has happened that even when the government has given them a good accommodation, they give that place on rent and go back and live in the slum. We are in the same situation. We are in spiritual slums and we don't even understand. So when the Bhagavad Gita comes and helps us, when it reaches out to us, when Krishna's words come to us, we feel like saying, Are, what's your problem? Yeah, I am happy. There are lots of people who say that. Because you've got acclimatized to sorrow. Now it is true that this formula that the Bhagavad Gita is offering us with this, even if you follow it sincerely, chances are you may not become realized in this lifetime. It's not a joke getting to realization. But at least you'll be out of this sorrow and suffering and stress and this, what the Bhagavad Gita calls is union with sorrow. At least you'll be out of this mess. So sign up for the Bhagavad Gita. Sign up means you don't have to do anything externally. Internally, within you, tell yourself, I will study the Bhagavad Gita and I must get to that state where I will be happy and not undergo these, the stress that comes from these changes. Now in verse 23, he talks about what happens to a sattvic person who transcends the gunas, because that is the question that Arjuna asks Krishna here in the 14th chapter. What are the lingers, means what are the signs of a person who has crossed over, transcended the gunas. And verse 23 is one of the many verses in the 14th chapter that explain this. Let's take a look at verse 23. Udasina vadasinaha 
गुणैर्यो न विचाल्यते Seated like one, unperturbed, one who is not moved by the gunas, who, understanding that gunas operate, is firm and unwavering. So when you see the play of gunas, and remain undisturbed by their effects. You don't suffer anymore. Spiritual seekers must develop this attitude of objectivity, remain firm within while the gunas are operating. Direct your attention to your own development. Don't get affected by the gunas. Now the problem with us is we are concerned with everybody else except ourselves. When you are committed to your own growth and you're working very hard at becoming a better person, you have no time to waste on others. So you will not gossip. You're not even interested in what happens to others. Of course, interested in the sense you are ready to help people. You don't sit in idle gossip. Throughout the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Guna Guneshu Vartante Iti Matvana Sajjate. Just understand that gunas are functioning. You understand this with reference to animals. What you don't understand is that there are cows and buffaloes among humans. There are people with characteristics of tigers and lions. There are others who are like deer timid like deer, affectionate like a pup and dangerous like cobras. All this is among humans. What a fantastic world we have. What a fabulous variety. See, in the animal kingdom, nothing affects you because you the understanding is clear that a dog will bark. A leopard will first attack you even if you are going with the attitude of helping the leopard. You know, in India, there was a man, I don't know whether he's still there, a few years ago, who used to go through villages. His mission in life was to help wild animals, leopards, who run, and in many villages, the wells, water wells, don't have walls. So you and I know that there is a well there. The poor animal doesn't know. It's running fast, and it falls into the well. It will die and perish there. So this man makes it his mission to save these animals. And it's not that easy. He can't go there and say, hold my hand, I'll pull you out. The leopard will first eat him up before getting out of the well. So he first has to anesthetize the leopard. And before the leopard is totally unconscious, pull him out of the well. And this is the best part, most important part. He gets the hell out of there before the leopard regains consciousness. So there is in this complete dedication and commitment to the animal. His only mission is to save that animal. But he knows fully well that he cannot expect the leopard to say thank you. Leopard will not be grateful to him and will attack him at the first opportunity. So he takes proper measures to protect himself, but he saves the leopard. And he has no hatred towards the leopard, no expectations, no demands. Use the same formula with human beings and you are fine. But you don't, you don't, you need to understand that their nature functions. Everybody acts according to their gunas their vasanas. There is nothing you can do about it. Even the person himself cannot do anything about it at the present moment. Yes, he can put in effort to change for the future. Once you understand this, you are a different person. You're not agitated by anything that happens around you. Otherwise, you spend your whole life complaining. 
as a great thinker said, all grumbling is tantamount to saying, oh, why is the lily not an oak? A lily is a delicate, beautiful flower. That oak is a mighty tree. How can you expect the lily to be a, an oak tree and an oak tree to be a lily? But you look at all our problems, they stem from just that. You expect an aggressive person to be timid. You expect a timid person to be assertive. You expect a talkative person to keep quiet. You expect a person who's constantly grumbling and complaining to be good natured. You must understand. So if you happen to have a family member who is who shows uh, qualities of a tiger, you must just understand here is a tiger without the stripes. That's it. And just as the animal lover works for the tiger's benefit, but make sure there is a, an adequate distance so that you are not within striking distance. Similarly, maintain that mental distance, which is objectivity and carry on in life with this firm understanding. That's what he's saying. You're firm and unwavering. You understand that which is beyond the gunas and reach the exalted state of realization as you apply these principles. And now, Let's take one more verse which speaks of the wise person. See, we are used to foolish people. There's no point talking about them. Let's take a look at the wise person so that we can emulate him or her and work towards that state. Verse 24. Samadukha sukha swasthaha Samaloshtashma kanchanaha Tulya Priya Priyo Dhiraha Tulya Nindatma Samstutihi The wise person, Dhiraha, established in the self, is equal to joy and sorrow, views a lump of earth, stone and gold alike, is the same to the agreeable and disagreeable, and the same in censure and praise. Dhiraha is a person who is detached from the effects of the gunas, who is objective with reference to the gunas, who understands how gunas function. So gunas manifest in the world as at the material level, earth, stone and gold. Is Swami Ramatirtha made the famous statement, iron and gold can buy iron and gold. That's it. Meaning, you understand the inherent value in material things. Iron and gold can only buy iron and gold. With wealth, you can buy only sense objects. You can't buy love. Every rich man wants to buy love through his money and fails miserably. You can't buy knowledge. So that is the limit of the material world. So how do you understand this? Where do you rise to a higher level? Like Sita in the Ramayana was perfectly happy, irrespective of whether she was enjoying the luxuries in the palace in Ayodhya or going through the trials and tribulations in Vanvas, in the jungle. Imagine from straight from the palace, she went to the jungle. No difference. She was just as happy because her attention was on Lord Rama. So when your attention is on Atman or anything higher, it doesn't matter to you the differences in the material world. Her problems arose only when her attention shifted from Rama to the golden fleeting deer. The deer represents material objects which are golden tantalizing, attractive, no doubt, but fleeting, passing, ephemeral. Dear, D-E-E-R, is all that is D-E-A-R to you at the moment, unfortunately. 
Then she was kept, taken hostage by Ravana, the ten-headed monster. Janaka was a king enjoying all the luxuries that a king could enjoy. Sudama was a pauper. It didn't make any difference to them. Both were at the same level of happiness because their attention was on Atman. At the physical level, you go through agreeable and disagreeable situations. We have just gone through a period of uh, intense heat and humidity, which saps you of energy. Now we are going through the monsoon where there is uh, rain and rain and rain, heavy rain and flooding sometimes. And then there are times when you go through bitter winter. Your health has its ups and downs. You go through pain. But again, when your attention is on, is on the higher, you endure that. It, it uh, doesn't make that much difference to you. The body feels it, but you're not affected. And these pairs of opposites are part and parcel of the world. So if you're living in the world, you have to learn the art of facing these challenges with courage, with strength. Similarly, emotionally, joy and sorrow are part of life. You have the option of, as human beings, feeling the emotion, intense love, terrible sorrow, all of these emotions without being affected. See, there are three categories of living beings, plant, animal, and human. Plants, for all practical purposes, don't even feel. So that is the state of tamas, indifference. Animals feel a, a lot of emotion. Birds die when the mate dies. A dog, even a pet dog, Alsatian, dies when the master leaves it. So on and so forth. A cow, there's a video that I saw the other day, so touching, of a cow whose male calf was taken away for slaughter and was being transported to the slaughterhouse. This cow ran after that tempo for seven miles. And when the man who was carrying the calf saw this, he was overcome with uh, emotion and took that calf away from the, took it out of the tempo and did not take it for slaughter, gave it back to the cow. So animals feel, but they are affected by it. They don't have a choice of not being affected. The human being is the only species in the world that has the capacity of feeling, not just emotion, intense emotion. But you have the option of not being affected. This must be exercised. Sydney Carton in The Tale of Two Cities loves this girl immensely, but he understands that he is a lawyer, he is not doing well, and he is a, he's a drunkard. And when a French nobleman comes and courts her, he, for the sake of her, and this is true love, he deliberately steps back and allows their romance to flourish. But till the last day of his life, he's committed to her and in fact gives her life so that she may be happy. What a man. This is true love. Uh, don't uh, get scared. You don't have to give your life for anybody. But it's just you feel there are no expectations. You're not attached. You make no demands on the other person. And throughout the relationship, you are only giving of yourself. At the intellectual level, there is censure and praise. But you understand that this is part of life. Like Shakespeare said, you often get it, reputation is an idle imposition, oft got without merit. When you don't deserve it, people praise you, you earn name and fame. And you lose things, you lose this reputation, often when you don't deserve it. So a wise person has no value for all of this. 
So what he's saying is the world means change. You must learn the art of sporting with the waves of change. How? By being rooted in Atman. We, unfortunately, have not developed this base or foundation. So you get tossed around. Make a conscious effort to free yourself from the bondage of the three gunas. Don't identify with them. Instead, fix a goal, a higher goal, and focus there. Samatvam will be the result. You will earn the status of Samatvam, Tulya, where you are the same, irrespective of what goes on around you. And such a person is a powerful person, is a happy person, a successful person. So with this, we come to the end of the 14th chapter. Thank you.